Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. And actually, I was delighted to be given the title that, uh, for my talk that the organizers gave me, which is not what I usually talk about. I usually talk about some details of a particular gene therapy that we've been working on, but they were really demanding that I ask the question about what impact gene therapy is going to have on public health. And as you'll see, um, I really didn't come out with the answer that I thought I would at first. And maybe it's not as supportive of gene therapy as I thought it would be either. So I want to present this to you, which I'm presenting for the first time, this perspective, and then be able to discuss with people what you think about it. So what I, I want to begin with talking about what the public health burden is of genetic disease, and then go through some things. And Dana gave a good introduction to gene therapy. And I'll be giving it from a little different perspective, but some overlap with that. Uh, how the field developed, and where it is today, and where it's likely to go in the next years. And then the last thing is what I realized over the past week. And that is, essentially, gene therapy is not going to be adequate to address the public health burden of genetic disease. But we have other technologies that are more suitable for this. And that, as in all of medicine, prevention is always better than treatment. And we do have, uh, we do have access to technologies that can uh, prevent a large part of the burden of genetic disease. So what are we working with? Well, we know in the human genome we have 20, 25,000 genes. And a lot of these, when mutated, will give rise to some pathology. And in fact, there's 6,000 rare diseases that have already been described, and that number is growing. And most of those are genetic diseases. And specifically, there's more than 3,000 disease genes that have been identified, and we know their sequences. So already, the scale of that is uh, pretty, uh, pretty great. And so you really have to think about how you're going to deal with that situation. Um, according to WHO, the prevalence of a serious genetic disease is something on the order of 1 in 100 people. And so given that there's about 7.8 billion people in the world, that's a huge number of individuals that we would like to be able to treat. Um, so, and so, uh, many of these diseases, as you know, create tremendous suffering and disability and often early death. So it is a heavy public health burden, and it is really a problem that humans need to solve. So gene therapy has always been a very logical way to approach this. Once we realized that we had mutant genes, let's just replace or fix that defective gene. And of course, the, the logic is clear. But what has taken a while is figure out how to actually do that. And so to do it, we're essentially using DNA as a therapeutic and usually protein coding DNA. And this contrasts to most of what's out there in medicine that uses small molecule drugs or recombinant proteins. Most of the applications, and what I'm going to focus on, is genetic diseases, uh, such as uh, SCID, beta thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, hemophilia, spinal muscular atrophy. These are some of those that have been the subject of gene therapy. And of course, there are thousands more. And so these cases have a single gene that's mutated. And we need to fix it some way. And historically, in gene therapy, that's involved adding the wild type gene. And now there are new strategies with CRISPR-Cas9, for example. It amplifies the uh, potential strategies that you could use. But in some way, you're going to manipulate the genome. And also, I should mention, there's increasing applications of this in cancer, which is sort of indirectly a genetic disease. And so the way the field developed is in the 1980s, the concepts were pretty clear in some of the tools. And in the 1990s, we had the first clinical trials, uh, basically unsuccessful, uh, but you know, necessary. And, but by the 2000s then, there were the first signs of success. And we were seeing occasional benefit from gene therapy. And where we are today, in 2019, in the United States, there's now 
for FDA approved gene therapies, and there's many more in the pipeline. So I would say there's a few dozen in the pipeline that are in advanced stage of clinical trials or uh, very close to that situation. So that's kind of where we are at. It's real now. And I would say having been in the trenches with this for over 20 years, it's a good feeling that it's starting to work. On the other hand, when you look at it on a global perspective, then what we've achieved is really dwarfed by the size of the problem that we're trying to attack. So what we've had to do is the practical problems are getting the therapeutic gene into the relevant cells. And since these are lifelong diseases, they, we need to have uh, generally long-term expression. And you have to do that safely, and that's been a challenge. And so as Dana mentioned, there's two general concepts for how to do the gene delivery. Ex vivo is delivering it to the cells in culture and then returning the cells to the patient. And this, I would say, has been the single most successful strategy, but it really only applies to blood cells. And the big hurdle is engraftment. And that works fine in blood because you know it's cells suspended in liquid and you can return cells that way. It works really badly in everything else. But fortunately, there are a lot of blood disorders that, and a lot of uh, non-blood disorders that can be addressed by genetically engineering blood cells. And so it's been successful and at the moment, the best vector system is using lentivirus. It started with retroviruses and once the AIDS virus was isolated, it turned out to have even just better properties. And that's really the vector of choice now for these therapies. And uh, the other strategy is in vivo, where you try to deliver DNA directly to the body. And that is situations where you really can't do it with blood cells, for example, liver, eye, muscle, and you really have to get into that tissue. And this has been challenging. It looks simpler, but getting effective delivery to the right location has been difficult. And I would say today, for sure, the best vector system for that is adeno-associated virus, AAV. And I know Eric Olson will talk about using that in muscle tomorrow. And it's being used by a lot of people in many different tissues. But it definitely has its limitations, like all technologies. So I want to focus a little bit on then the hematopoietic stem cell. So this is the uh, in vivo strategy that's been successful. And it was really the first thing that worked. And it was for this disease, severe combined immune uh, deficiency, where the baby is uh, born without an immune system and used to have to then be isolated uh, to protect it from contact from infection. And you can see a skid baby in the tent there with his, with his uh, brother and not being able to actually touch the baby. And, and this, I'm happy to say, uh, has been solved by gene therapy. So we can now cure this disease definitively with gene therapy. It's very rare. It's a rare autosomal recessive. But the reason it was the first is because when you cure it, the cells that you give the, um, you give the uh, therapeutic gene to have a selective advantage. And so it meant that you could do this kind of badly and inefficiently and still cure patients. And so we've moved on from this now to more challenging diseases, but you have to start at the beginning. And so this, um, this is now cured, and the basic process has not changed very much. It's just that a lot of little things have been improved. There's no one single breakthrough that have now made this work and it's all more efficient and we can consider many other diseases that don't necessarily have a selective advantage. And basically you need to get um, hematopoietic stem cells out of the bone marrow or sometimes you can get it out of peripheral blood, culture them in vitro, add a cocktail of cytokines to get them to divide and then infect them with usually today lentiviruses or there's some other strategies now with CRISPR-Cas9 where you can electroporate in the therapeutic um, uh, proteins and then infuse the cells back into the patient. And so, in fact, it's medically quite intensive. It's essentially a bone marrow transplant. And so that means you're in the hospital and you know, it is medically intensive, so it's, it's important to realize that. <laughs> Uh, so, as I mentioned, now we, there are a couple different forms of SCID, 
that have been uh, cured. And in fact, several other rare immune deficiencies uh, have been cured that were genetic diseases where you could um, bring back the therapeutic protein and restore a functioning immune system. And so there are people walking around, probably at least 100 people more now, that would have been uh, dead, basically, that are now survived and leading a normal life because of gene therapy. So that's a success, and there's no doubt about it. Um, now, I want to move to some other diseases of the blood, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease that present some different challenges. But in general, I would say there's many diseases uh, where you can use this strategy, hematopoietic stem cells, gene edit them either with a lentivirus or with CRISPR-Cas9 or some other system and uh, uh, carry out the appropriate repair and put them back in the patient and get a cure. So that's a strategy that's been validated in the real world, and there is a lot you can do with it. Um, so the state of affairs, I mentioned that there are, there are four of these um, uh, therapies now approved in the US and are commercialized and are out there. And the first two that happened in 2017 are actually CAR T, and so this is a genetic engineering of T cells for cancer, and um, they can cure cancer, at least some of, some of the time. It's pretty impressive. The data is pretty impressive. But I mentioned that you know, these are now in the hands of large pharmaceutical companies, and the cost just for the genetic uh, therapy is several hundred thousand dollars. And by the time you get done with the hospital costs, and very often there's several weeks in intensive care involved, it's a million dollar therapy. And, and of course, since we're talking cancer, there's tens of thousands of patients for these particular cancers that these have been approved for. So m uh, many more patients than the rare diseases for like skid. Uh, so another one that was approved in 2017, this was an uh, in vivo gene therapy using AAV for genetic blindness, retinitis pigmentosa. There's many forms of it. So this was the first one, and it got uh, approved. And it's effective for greatly improving the vision, although it doesn't bring people back to normal vision, but it changes their lives and greatly improves their vision just by basically delivering the gene to the retina. And again, uh, the companies uh, involved is charging $400,000 per eye. So to get both of your eyes fixed, again, it's close to a million dollars. So uh, the most recent one just came this year, uh, this Zoll Gensma. And this is for um, SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, which is a terrible disease. And in this form, basically, it's a floppy baby that uh, doesn't have uh, control over its muscles. And again, this will generally lead to early death. And this AAV therapy of bringing in the therapeutic gene is quite effective and has dramatic uh, improvements on these babies and how they develop and what they're able to do. And so the, it was like the typical story here. The technology was developed in universities, moved out to startups, then when it starts working, the startups are often bought by large pharmaceutical companies. And they chose a price for this of $2.1 million. And so the justification uh, that they're using is that uh, for some of these, if you lived with the disease, you'd end up spending more than that um, for all the intensive care that you would need. And so this is, this is justified. But whether you agree with that or not, it's a high price, and you have to worry about whether this is going to be sustainable, and certainly on a global level, absolutely not. Um, and so another one that I'll mention, because I want to talk about beta thalassemia, is uh, the lentiglobin that Dana discussed that was developed by Bluebird Bio and just approved in Europe a few months ago, and we expect will be approved in the, UA, in the US in 2020. Uh, and so they have it working, a lentivirus, and it carries the beta globin gene, and it can address both beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So I want to talk about those because they raise some, some different situations. 
And so these diseases have mutations in beta globin, which of course essential protein for carrying oxygen in our blood. And the two very common ones are beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. They're autosomal recessive, meaning that you have a, car a carriers have one mutant gene. And uh, as Dana alluded to, having that one mutant gene actually gives you resistance to malaria. And that is no trivial thing. Um, and, and that is why these, these um, diseases are so prevalent because there are millions of patients, because I just remind you that malaria prevalence in the world is still over 200 million cases a year. And so it's actually more than all the genetic diseases combined. And it still leads to about a half a million deaths a year, mostly in Africa in children under five. So that's the reality. And also a reminder that having a mutant gene can be a good thing. And so getting rid of that mutant gene is maybe not really what we want. And actually, I say this because I found out all of my grandparents came from Greece. And I found out when I was pregnant, I was tested that I was carrying a mutant globin gene. And so my partner was tested. But since he was from Northern Europe, he was not. And so and, and you know, malaria used to be endemic in Greece and Italy. It isn't anymore, but the genes are still there. So, you know, um, it's very, very prevalent. So, okay, beta thalassemia, 1.5% uh, of the human population are carriers of a mutant gene. So, uh, and we, we have 100,000 babies born with a severe form of the gene every year. Highest today in India, the Middle East, North Africa, and Southern Europe. And when you have a real knockout of, the, of beta globin, you have transfusion dependent anemia, meaning that you need frequent, like monthly, blood transfusions uh, in order to survive. And those have a number of side effects. And of course, that's very invasive. And untreated patients, which is most of the patients in the world, die in the first few years of life. So this is, this is creating a tremendous burden on infant mortality in the world. Now uh, we have this gene therapy that Bluebird Bio developed. And I should say several other companies are involved, as you might expect, for a disease this prevalent. And so there are, are a number of gene therapies in the pipeline that are likely to work uh, to address this. And Bluebird, they've priced theirs at 1.8 uh, million. And it just involves a lentiviral transfer of a marked globin gene. And although it was approved for beta thalassemia, the exact same vector also works for sickle. So that's also in the pipeline. And they use that, that transplantation strategy that I showed you. Um, so sickle is another a specific mutation in beta globin, a specific amino acid change. So it's always the same thing. In, be in beta thalassemia, you're just knocking out uh, beta globin in any number of ways. With sickle, it's a specific mutation, and it changes the conformation of the blood cell, the red blood cell, from its normal donut shape to the sickle shape. And that causes lots of problems. And basically, these occlude capillaries, and you get ischemia, pain, organ damage. Uh, So this is something that is diagnosed early at four to five, six months of age. You will know that the baby has this, and then leading to this acute pain, organ damage. And as Dana mentioned, it's actually the most common genetic disease in the United States because more than 10% of our population originated in Africa. And so they were carrying it at a very high uh, rate and so African Americans, one in 12, are carriers for this disease. And so that results in that figure. Uh, and again, without treatment, it will be early death. And so this strategy, which Dana also uh, mentioned, I just thought, since we're talking about CRISPR-Cas9 a lot, this is a way, the, the first thing that came out uh, from Bluebird is bringing in a wild-type beta-globin gene. But you can also get at it by knocking out the repressor, 
of fetal globin, which works very well in adults. And normally, it's silenced in us. But if you bring it back, it substitutes very well for beta globin. And so that's a good CRISPR-Cas9 strategy, because you can use the knockout NHEJ, which is efficient. Um, so that's also in clinical trials. And the very early results suggest that it's going to work. And this is just, again, you can uh, use that strategy both for sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. And again, you can, you can do homology-directed repair, but it's less frequent, so that one is, is not as advanced. But that, that will also probably become viable. So the problem then, one problem with this, is the cost of the gene therapy is not appropriate you know, for most of the patients. So globally, we have 4.4 million patients, but the majority of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, where the carrier frequency is really astounding, so 10 to 40 percent across equatorial Africa. And so that kind of tells you that there's a selective advantage for carrying it, because that's uh, unheard of for most genetic diseases. If you see that, you know there's a selective advantage for carrying the mutant allele, and that's even worth it. Um, even though one out of four offspring of two carriers are going to be affected and will die, it's still been worth it evolutionarily to carry that gene. And so just to take one country, um, Nigeria, which is a, a highly populous country in, in uh, Africa, 2% of the newborns are being born with sickle cell disease. And we'll prob most of those are going to die. And over 300,000 uh, infants a year born with it. And so uh, the prices I mentioned that the companies want to charge are in the range of $1.2 million. But in these affected countries, the public health budget per person is in the neighborhood of $50 a year. So we're not even close. There's several orders of magnitude difference between um, you know, what is being looked at in the developed world versus what could actually um, help most of the patients in the world. And so this is Hans Rosling's map of the World Health Chart, where he maps income on the x-axis axis and lifespan as kind of a general measure of health on the y-axis. Mm -hmm. And you can see, and although if you study you know, development, there's been tremendous progress, especially in the last 20 years, in development. But we still have the bottom billion countries, and the blue is Africa, most of them in Africa, that are very poor and, you know, can't, and do not have access uh, to much in the way of public health. And so it's absurd to think that the kind of gene therapy that we're developing in the US is going to have any relevance whatsoever for those people. Um, so that's actually the reality uh, about this, which I guess hadn't hit me this hard until last week when I was preparing for this talk, you know, because I've been a believer in gene therapy. And I am a believer in gene therapy. And I think we'll always need gene therapy. But there has to be a different solution to get at that in any reasonable time frame. So, um, what is it? Well, you know, so of course the price is, this is kind of first generation gene therapy. So you could hope that you're going to gain at least an order of magnitude on reducing these prices just through technological innovations. For example, not having to do personalized therapy, but having universal cells that can be accepted and not, uh, not have an immune rejection. Uh, that isn't available now, but that is under study. If that were to be available, then you could, you know, certainly that would simplify the procedure. You wouldn't have to do personalized medicine for everybody. Um, so that's part of it. And also increased competition. And it'll be interesting to see when several other companies get their products approved for sickle and beta thalassemia, what happens, you know, to the prices. Hopefully we'll see some movement downward when there's competition. And maybe China will do something. So, uh, but you know, I think the real answer is something that we already have, and that is to emphasize prevention over treatment. And to tell you the truth, it's something that pretty much doesn't get talked about in the gene therapy field. And it isn't something I had worked on, but I think I am going to now. 
um, because I think it's actually going to be much more effective. So I'll show you um, why. And so basically what we need and what's actually feasible is we need widespread genetic screening to identify carriers and in that way, you could potentially avoid or at least identify the at-risk pregnancies. And of course, we know we have even commercially available um, uh, genetic screening and, and DNA sequencing, but they're not in widespread use. And for at-risk pregnancies, where you have two carriers that have produced the pregnancy, then you do have available now prenatal genetic testing in the first trimester. And so you can test uh, the embryo, and you would have the option to terminate. Or, as I'll show you in a little more detail, you can use IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing of early embryos, and that way be sort of a, just start with a healthy embryo to begin with. And, and then I wanted to mention, even though it's after the fact, we will always still have people born with genetic diseases. I don't think we'll ever be able to eliminate all of it because not all of it is familiar. Familial. There are also new mutations happening all the time. And so, you know, uh, but even today, we could do much more extensive newborn screening than we currently do because, in general, the earlier you catch a genetic disease, the more effective it, the uh, gene therapy will be. Uh, because you have a small target and so on, and it's before the degeneration that often accompanies these. For example, you know, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, usually not diagnosed until the child is three or four years old. By that time, sometimes the mother has already had another child, which had a 50% chance of having the exact same disease. But if you had done newborn screening, you would find that out. Of course, better yet, screening of the parents, you know, before the pregnancy. And so we know we can do DNA testing now for really hundreds of different diseases scattered. This is just a sampling all around the chromosomes. And, you know, we can do whole genome sequencing too. And when you think about that, that costs less than $1,000 now. That is, uh, might, is expensive for some countries, but at least it begins to be feasible, and it's dropping all the time versus these million dollar price tags and really intensive medicine that's involved in uh, gene therapy, like uh, any of these really, but certainly with the bone marrow transplantation, that's pretty intensive medicine. And so I wanted to say a little more, and this also I think is important for the um, gene editing talks that will come later, and we may see this again, but I wanted to introduce this pre-implantation genetic testing during in vitro fertilization. And just to make the point that this is not theoretical, this is in practice now, and this can avoid transmission of familial genetic disorders. So, and what you do today, you don't even have to sample the embryo itself, but just the troph ectoderm cells from the blastocyst, which are genetically identical to the embryo, and test them, then do very rapid testing on those, and uh, be able to avoid embryos that are carrying the mutation lo you're looking for, or maybe any mutation if you do it comprehensively. And so this has already been performed in over 100,000 IVF cycles. And right now, 2% of the children being born in the United States are being born through in vitro fertilization. And so it's becoming a large scale and only growing in scale um, methodology for uh, producing a child. And so it's already been done, and already 400 single gene disorders have been diagnosed in this way with pre-implantation genetic testing. So, you know, again, it's not theoretical. It works right now, and clearly we've already avoided probably tens of thousands of patients born with genetic disease by applying this. And so an IVF is not cheap, but it's in the range of $20,000. But again, that's still dwarfed by the prices of the gene therapy that we're seeing. So, you know, I would say it's safer because you're not manipulating the embryo easier and cheaper than, you know, thinking about germline gene editing. And so, again, for at least thinking about genetic diseases that we know about, that this is a pathway that's open to us that could be used more intensively.
And then this is just a diagram uh, of how it works. Uh, so in the early embryo, and we're talking uh, a few days of gestation, you have the inner cell mass that's going to become the baby, but then all these cells are derived from that, that same uh, fertilized egg. And so typically you have about five of these in an IVF cycle. So just statistically, most of them, or there will be some, almost always, that are normal. And you can just choose to transfer those into the patient. So there'll be no chance that these mutant embryos go on to form a baby. And this applies to both dominant and recessive traits. So just we've been talking about recessive traits like beta thalassemia and sickle. And most genetic diseases are recessive. And so you need two bad copies to have the disease. And typically, the carrier has little or no symptoms. So it's not a problem to be a carrier. In fact, it can even be a really good thing if you live in a region that has endemic malaria. Um, but so let's say both parents then are carriers. And then you will have three out of four of the embryos that are going to be normal. Two carriers, one completely normal. And only one that would have given rise to the disease that you can now avoid. And even in a dominant situation, uh, where you have a, a, uh, one parent with a dominant disease, and it's in heterozygous because, in fact, it's pretty much unknown that you have a homozygous dominant. It's pretty much lethal. So that just shows, and I will wrap up. Um, uh, and, and just to say that this really works in the real world, a couple of examples, Tay-Sachs in the Ashkenazi Jewish population has been almost eliminated through carrier screening and fetal diagnosis. And likewise, beta thalassemia, which is very prevalent in Greece and Italy, has fallen dramatically now, many fewer babies born, through this carrier screening and fetal diagnosis. And so those programs have been in place now for a few decades and almost eliminating the number of people born with those diseases. So it's another way to solve genetic disease other than gene therapy. So to summarize, for sure, gene therapy can address the most common and easiest to treat genetic diseases and you know, when you consider that there's thousands of these, how realistic is it anyway that we're gonna develop a gene therapy for every one of them? Not very realistic, but actually it is realistic that we could do whole genome sequencing and find out about the carriers for every single one of them. That's actually much more feasible and far cheaper than going through the development of a gene therapy for all of these. Uh, so I would say a prevention strategy involving genetic screening which we already have the technology for, but we don't apply it widely. Um, it really could be technically feasible, inexpensive, and more comprehensive, and actually have the best chance to address the, the global burden of genetic disease. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.